everybody for, for coming and being patient and letting us jump into the, to our presentation about open source coding uh, adventures in Salesforce. Um, which some of you are probably here because you're the one. I'm curious, just to get a read of audience, like how many people in here are developers? Yay. Great. <laughs> <laughs> what are the rest of you? I use Salesforce. You, you use do? It? Okay. Awesome. Anybody else use Salesforce as part of their Architects. Architects? Awesome. Are they here for the VR? Well, I think the VR one. That, again. that was a previous oh. session. Because okay. I went to that yeah. one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was like two sessions. That was a good ago. session. <laughs> that was a good session. Um, well, awesome. Um, and then we got half well, that, the room. That answered part of your question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. People voted with their feet like it's supposed to That's happen. That's right. That's right. Um, well, we're, I guess, really excited today. We're going to do a quick introduction to ourselves. Um, so I'm Ryan Blake. Um, I am a solutions engineer for a, non, uh, for a, a Salesforce consulting firm um, that works with nonprofit and higher education institutions. I am not a technical person by uh, <laughs> education. Um, I don't want to say quite by trade, but, um, but my whole journey started with working in higher ed. We made a transition to Salesforce. I got sucked into it and really started to see the opportunities it was going to provide uh, from a business perspective and a higher perspective, and then started to um, recognize the uh, technology person in me and really started to dive in deeper and deeper with a lot of guidance from, from that, to be honest. So um, It was so pretty been... cool to watch. I mean, <laughs> he like found a, a niche in IT from being an admissions, running the admissions yeah. counselors to like all of a sudden becoming a Salesforce guru. <laughs> That's a strong word. Yeah, <laughs> maybe it's not appropriate but I'll take either. Um, I'm Thad Dahlberg. I'm a senior software engineer at the University of St. Thomas, and I work on a team with the enterprise application and cloud people, which um, includes like deploying thing to AW, uh, things to AWS and, and running a bunch of custom-made Java apps that we've massaged through the ages. And uh, when I first started, I, I inherited a bunch of admissions Java apps. But at the same time, the admissions was turning into uh, turning to Salesforce as their system of engagement. So we were taking in all of our applications, uh, but I inherited these Java apps that it, uh, that uh, took in visit um, form people. So when people someone would want to come, <laughs> someone would want to come to St. Thomas, they would fill out this form and say, "I want to come. I want to meet a coach. I want to do all this stuff," and that was all a custom Java app that went into a custom Oracle database and. Um, yeah. The problem was I either had to make that up to Salesforce and include that data so that admissions counselor could see someone wanted to come visit, they'd hang off their contact, rec contact record and that sort of thing. So I had a choice and in the end I decided to go native Salesforce and that's where the project we're going to talk about came from. And you can see my quote is, if I build it, they will tell me what they want, which has <laughs> been yes. kind of how higher ed has worked for me, but it's also been a great way to engage with people and see how they're using what I made. Um, also, you'll notice that one of our sayings at St. Thomas, all for the common good, it sounds cheesy, but we, we do live it all the way to the staff level, and that's kind of the reason we were allowed to open source our event solution that I just talked about, and we'll show that off in a, bit, a little bit here. Yeah. So, um, I, it's the, before I just run through this verbatim, but like how many people are already familiar with Salesforce and like what Salesforce is? It's about everybody, um, <laughs> or for the most part. Um, so just to run through a couple of things here, Salesforce is right. It's a big now technology group, to say the least, um, and they tend to describe their product as more of a platform um, than an actual product because it's something that's intended to be built on. It's also evolved tremendously, and now Salesforce is not just one thing. It's now become a variety of actual products. Um, so by them acquiring a lot of different small and smaller companies. Their whole mindset is around being API first. So with their core CRM, which is really the focal point of what we're uh, talking about today, is the, their core platform, which is the CRM, um, is built API first, so it's intended to ingest and really talk to and, and take data in as well as much take data out. Uh, and that this infinite data possibilities. Um, this I really like, and I am the first one to say that I feel like Salesforce can do anything um, when it comes to a business process, but that's me as a non-technical person, as we'll highlight again. Um, so I've always been like, well, yes, if you explain something, you talk about your process, we can, we can do that in Salesforce, um, we can make it work. The question is always like, should we, right? It's that buy versus build type mentality. Um, but 
realistically, there's still the, the infinite possibilities associated to it. Um, and it's all this clicks not code mentality. Um, it's the idea that somebody like myself can get in there and can make magic happen um, without actually having to understand code, read code, uh, have to actually start from nothing. You can use its declarative processes to actually make Salesforce function in a really intentional and meaningful way uh, to facilitate your business processes and manage your, your business in general. Um, the other side of Salesforce, you can go to the next slide, um, is really the salesforce.org side. So I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna say dates because I'm gonna get them wrong. But when salesforce.com, the company came out, they started a whole other company called salesforce.org with a little bit of a different mission and goal. And that goal was to really focus on the nonprofit side of business um, and also have a little more of a philanthropic component to their business strategy. Um, so they started, they had started this one, one, one mentality or process that was like, they're gonna donate 1% of their earnings, 1% of their time and 1% of, of their product. Of their product. Um, so in doing that, one of the things in, that they came up with was this um, nonprofit 10 license um, program to where if you are a 501c3, you can get 10 free Salesforce licenses at absolutely no cost uh, with no strings attached. Um, and it is actually a full production org that is living and breathing that is literally no cost. Um, and it sounds amazing, but um, it's f more free like a puppy and not like a beer, right? You can drink <laughs> a beer, you can be done, and you can walk away. You get a free puppy, that is work, that is um, responsibility, that is time over time. You have to really like make sure it's gonna be in good hands or you're gonna have a dog that's peeing all over the floor all the time. You don't want that, specifically within the technology that you're trying to run your business on. Um, but I think that the whole concept of it is Salesforce is really trying to design this mentality that you can use this really powerful platform for your nonprofit and higher ed institutional purposes. Um, and there's other limitations. So like I mentioned, Enterprise Edition on there. That's a step below like the top level edition where there's a couple additional features. But for the most part, it's everything that you would need. Um, and that mentality has really started to spark into this whole other environment. One of them being um, the open source commons, which is what we're talking about and how we got into it, about providing these solutions that are creating these, this large, or, sorry, creating solutions that are um, solving common problems. So when you think about something like this free Salesforce org, it, their Salesforce, with the community support, developed a nonprofit data architecture that supports the way that nonprofits traditionally manage their, their uh, constituents in a CRM um, fashion. So thinking about it from donor and fundraising, things are already pre-built that you can install for free on the platform. Um, same, they've done the same thing with the education and the education-based data architecture. Uh, they do other things and other products that are out there that, again, are at no cost, like a volunteer management system. Um, that you can pay somebody to actually right, use it in, in a software that you're downloading on your computer, or you can use it on Salesforce, which is already at no cost. You're downloading this um, additional application that is solving for a solution that you already have. So it becomes this, this cycle of um, community development within the nonprofit and education community that started to really empower these nonprofit organizations to use a platform at a reduced cost, knowing that they are benefiting from it, but Salesforce is also contributing to a greater good in that sense. Um, and this is kind of where our application gets into um, man or building in the open source and kind of what we were uh, saying with the title, getting to the open source space um, in Salesforce, which has been an interesting ride to say the least so far. In that context, because Salesforce.org, the entity, and then now it's been absorbed back yes. into Salesforce.com, but they still call it Salesforce.org, has really like spearheaded the open source idea in the community. So. It allowed us to do the things that we were going to about ready to show you, and we're going to actually show you some tools yep. that we use um, to build out our code. So, so this is just a little bit about the open source commons. Um, I'm not going to read this through verbatim, uh, verbatim um, but I think more so focused on like the projects that are out there. So some of it is just about usability. Salesforce already has a ton of free resources. Anybody in this room not only can download and or go to trailhead.salesforce.com, um, and um, learn how to use their platform at no cost and get an environment to actually build and do everything. Uh, but you can also like go get a free developer org that isn't tied to a trailhead and like start using Salesforce on your own. Um, there's limitations to that. But um, the whole idea is like using the tool, how do you use it from a nonprofit fashion? Everything Salesforce put, puts out there is very sales and business focused. 
Um, so a whole community has built in a whole video library about how to use their tools, uh, best practices about how to use it, um, and, and made it so that people have a common way of doing things, even though everybody has their, um, may have their own methods. And then the other ones, in terms of like the free products, um, some of those, all of those were all started in the open source commons community. That last one, that outbound funds module, Salesforce actually saw the use of that and said, okay, this is, a lot of people are needing this. However, the community cannot keep pace with what the community is asking for, so why don't we absorb it and take hold of that? And like, let's own that, but still let the community develop it. We will just make sure it is the best it can be. And this is Salesforce thing. Let's also make a side module that you can pay for with some additional <laughs> features, yeah. um, but you still get the core of it um, for free, to say the least, of what the community built initially at the Salesforce and level of quality. We've been talking a lot about op um, you know, yeah. the nonprofit side of things, but you can use the tools that we're using right now to build your own applications that you can sell yeah. in the App Exchange and all that things, or you, you, you can uh, use the same tools, because uh, Salesforce.org doesn't care, it's open source, you can use, use it as you will. Yep. So that being said, I'm going to start talking about code stuff for you developers in the room. Um, a chip on my shoulder has always been the clicks not code thing, like, well, where's the code? Do we have to use code anymore? Yes, there's tons of code to be done. Um, there, uh, there's a programming language called Apex, which I'm sure um, is an oracle. It's Java, basically, with uh, all your imports decided for you and um, uh, the data model hooked up pretty quickly. Um, so it's kind of, for me, it's delightful. I was a little bit tired of like managing all the libraries. And uh, for instance, when the log4j issue happened, uh, my Java team had to go and find everywhere we've used it. And then do we still need to use it even? Or do we need to upgrade it? Or we need to fix this? I just had to wait for Salesforce to do that. And they were on it right away. And so in that sort of way, if you're tired of managing libraries in Maven or whatever library manager you're using, it's already done for you. You just have to find out how to connect to it. So like encryption libraries and all that stuff are built into Salesforce. Uh, Visual Force, which is uh, kind of an old school thing that we actually use in our product. It's kind of like a JSP page. It's a templatable um, um, markup language kind of thing that you can iterate over data with and things like that. Um, then there's Lightning Web Components, which is a very uh, standard tech using CSS, HTML, and JavaScript, but also has a kind of a framework where it wires really easily back to the Apex controllers you can build. Um, so you kind of have this uh, view, or you have the view, and then you have the JavaScript model, then you have the, uh, uh, let's see, the Apex model that reaches into the, or the Apex uh, controller that reaches to the model. I got that mixed up, but there's two, you know, in between points. So one of the biggest tools that we got from salesforce.org is this continuous integration Python code, coded um, tool. And uh, one of the missing elements in Salesforce, if you're a developer, is that you need to run your code locally before you want to release it to the world. But how do you run Salesforce locally? It's a cloud-based thing. I can imagine that if we brought it back to our computer, it would bring our computer to a crawl to run it. And so what Salesforce, um, I think it's 2017 or something, started building these things called scratch orgs, which are your, your uh, developer like one-off orgs where you uh, spin them up, they can last up to 30 days, you can push code to them, pull code from them. They act like your local running uh, Salesforce. And so what, what uh, Cumulus CI does is automate the Salesforce command line, which you can do on your own, but also uh, uh, takes care of some of the GitHub uh, dependencies when, when you come to packaging or you're doing releases and things like that, it also like, will install other packages you may de be dependent upon. So sometimes you want to interact with something that's already built in another app. A scratch org, you can have that installed um, you know, as you want to get your environment up and running locally. In this case, you want to make sure the org that you're building is exactly the org that you need to be programming against so that you're not sitting there configuring it uh, for like an hour or two before you actually get to work on it. And Cumulus allows you with a little YAML magic to configure an org to maybe install some dependencies to maybe, you know, in our case we install some sample data, we set up a site, we set up sharing rules and permissions and all that stuff is done. So from within about five minutes, two to five minutes, our app, which is called Summit Events, will be spun up and ready to work on and then you're just um, pulling in code from it. So. 
You can see that on GitHub is kind of the source of truth where we do our packaging, which Cumulus helps us with. We can make a beta package. It will take all the release, um, the, the pull requests and categorize them and make the nice release notes for you. And it will uh, uh, promote that into a, a release package at the end so you can install it in a production org. And um, when you're a developer, of course, you pull your, your, your clone and branch your Git repository, you uh, run a few lines of code, it spins up your scratch org, you can, it's ready to go, you can push code from that, and since Salesforce has got a lot of declarative things we talked about, you can do clicks. Mm -hmm. um, you want to be able to know when that org has changed. So Cumulus takes a snapshot as soon as it makes that org, and so as you enter that org and change it, you can say, show me what changed about this org, and pull it back into your code. So then you can start, you know, again, another scratch org. You know, you want to continuously be building and destroying these so you, you know that it works. Um, we'll be able to be spun up with the changes that you made with clicks. So there's a lot of arrows here. And if you're a Git person, you, you understand, you know, you're cloning to your local repo. You're creating a scratch org. You're pulling back, you know, information from that scratch org. You can push up new code to that scratch org uh, to see if it works. And then it, eventually you're you know, doing a pull request all the way back to the source of truth, the main branch. So yell if you have questions, but now we're going to actually do that. So this is what a Cumulus project would be from the get-go, and it's going to be a live demo, and I'm going to probably make mistakes. I'm going to copy, whoops, I'm going to copy uh, one line of code because I hate typing this one in. <laughs> that's one long command there, set default dev hub username. So I'm going to use, uh, I usually use IntelliJ with this tool called Illuminated Cloud, but I'm going to use um, the one that um, a lot of Salesforce people use is Visual Studio Code because there's a lot of, uh, Salesforce has done a lot of work to build extensions into this and it's free. Um, but if you really want to, you know, develop well, I recommend using IntelliJ with Illuminated Cloud because it's like, it's got all your PMD for Apex built in, and it connects to orgs really well. It takes a headache out of pushing and pulling, and then I can even grab um, uh, code or metadata from another org and bring it into my current iteration, so it's, it's really useful. But all of what I'm going to show you right now can be done in the command line. Let's see. Oops, I had it open already. So I'm going to make a new folder. An open folder. And I'm going to do a new folder here. Call it minibar 16. And open that folder. So we have an empty folder here. And we have a oops, terminal thing going on there. I'm going to open a terminal. And um, the first thing you'll want to do is, um, oh, I to capitalize that, git. Get in at this, and uh, then we're going to run a simple command to um, have Cumulus build us a project. And this will give us all the structure we need to start building a um, Cumulus CI project. Oh, what did I get there? <laughs> uh, I'm misspelling. David said you were going to make an error. He's trying to iterate through all the integers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So it gives you some prompts, like most of the time these are defaults, but you, you might want to, is this a managed package? No, managed packages are like, some events is a managed package, but it's like your code is hidden from the production orgs and you can install it and some of the limits are lifted once you pass security review, which Summit Events has, um, which gives it, makes it advantageous. The API version is like what version of Salesforce is this? Was this meant to run in when it was built? So it kind of scales itself to new features, if, you know you can actually increase your API later in the game. SFDX is a format of uh, uh, how, how uh, code is uh, managed in the, in the environment. The old one is MDAPI, which don't use that. <laughs> uh, the, since this is an open source thing, it's asking me whether I want to use NPS, NPSP or EDA, which is what Ryan was talking about, yeah. education data, data architecture. And we're not going to use any of that because it will install that and it will take forever. I'm going to call this main. It takes like 20 minutes. Those are like giant <laughs> architectures that they're implementing in Salesforce. 
um, really meaningful, but when doing project development, it takes a while. It has a keyword for unit tests that it likes you to use. So when you make unit tests, you use an underscore test at the end. Um, let's say we're going to cover Apex coverage. So we seventy-five percent is the standard you have to meet to um, to get something in a production org. You can put it in developer orgs and things, but if it goes into a production org, all your unit tests have to get over seventy-five percent coverage. Is that kind of arbitrary. Yeah. Well, you, it could be. I mean, if you do your test well and do a lot of asserts and stuff, it, it's helpful. But you can just go for coverage, and then yeah, you're right. Um, but if you're going through security review with Salesforce, they'll call you on that and say, you need some system asserts here. Okay, so we, you can see over here we have a structure that Cumulus built for us. And one of, the, one of the things is this YAML file where this is where the configuration ma uh, magic happens if you're building an org. Um, this is a very default one. There's nothing fancy here happening, but I can show you our Summit Events one, and you'll see a lot of things that you can do with it. And so let's go back to the terminal. Going to add this all to our Git. I'll get it in there. Did I spell something wrong? <laughs> no. Okay, so we've added it all. Um, so now the next thing we have to do is we have our structure. We can this can actually build a scratch org, but one thing you always have to do is um, that's a key binding. You have to authenticate against an org. So um, you a free developer org and authenticate against that, but this basically kind of defines your scratch org structure or version, but also how many scratch orgs you can make. So if you're actually a paying customer, you can get hundreds of scratch orgs. With a developer version, you can have five. But you know what you can do? You can have 500 developer versions. They don't really limit it. And then they just make them expire if you don't log into them. So I think those ones don't quite feel like a year. I think the developer orgs last 12 months. Yeah, so now it's popping me into Salesforce, and I'm going to authenticate against the developer org. Let's see, I think I did release. One thing about the org as well is you need to have this, this dev hub feature turned on, which is already turned on here, but you can research that if you want to. I'm not going to show it to you. I think you actually just type in dev hub and then like slide. Move yeah, you're right. Okay, fine. Over. Dev it's really, Hub. It's really simple. There it is. More so just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan made me do it. I didn't make you do it. I was just saying, if you're actually looking yeah, for so it. So you have to turn it on. It's enabled there. Oh, it's there. a button. Sorry. Yeah. That was a slider. So now if we go back to our terminal, it will say that we successfully authorized an org. So now um, we simply have to, um, well, one thing I like to do is default. My dev org, because you'll, I'll show you in a second, but Cumulus has the ability to have release orgs and QA orgs and things like that. And I'm mostly dealing with the dev org, so this eliminates me having to do dash dash org dev every time I do a command. And I'll show you that right here. So you can see this org, these are all the orgs built. I, I defaulted the dev org right there. And so now I'm going to spin up a scratch org, and hopefully this goes fairly quickly. So um, there are flows and tasks in um, Cumulus CI. Tasks are like one-off things. Flows are sets of tasks. It's very similar to some GitHub things and other things that people will be aware of. But um, the main task that you run to, to run your code, if I had any code, which I don't right now, uh, this would spin up the org, add the, the code, and then any YAML configuration I have in the Cumulus CI YAML file will actually morph that org into exactly what I need it to be. So we're going to do a simple one here. So flow run dev org. And this will go out and request a scratch org. That's what it's doing right now. And um, it will also validate all your code before it pushes it up. So it will fail if your code is messy. This is sad when you forgot to pull some quick environment thing down. And maybe your, your scratch org ex expired mid noodling in a controller, then you're going to get angry and you're going to have to figure it out so that you can spin up the scratch hard. And as you're talking to this, one of the things that like, as part of the reason why we want to really show this is because being an open source, right, I think there's, a, there's been a couple presentations that have referenced open source today. Um, and like being in there, you know that it's a community developed application. 
But the fact that we're like doing it with Salesforce just seems a little bit more nuanced, being that Salesforce has an app exchange, right, where you can just go download just about anything. Um, there's a whole community, and like to make sure that we're iterating and developing a product that people see as quality, not just as, I think that was maybe my first impression as a non-tech person, of like open source, how good are those things? And Thad started rattling off a bunch of things that are open source, <laughs> and I was like, oh. No, they're, um, they're good and bad at times. <laughs> yeah, can vary, right? But like, yeah. this is one of the ways that, as an individual, we, like, we can start to make it really easy. And I think this is what, for me, I think I had to learn like five commands to really actually do this and spin up a scratch org to get something there to even just add a field to make sure that we're not now creating seven fields, right? Because all of this can then push into GitHub to do the yeah. pull request and to do the really meaningful development process within an open source project that is really entirely community led. And I think the only Salesforce element of it is trying to organize the events to get people together. <laughs> um, they're not, they don't have any oversight. They actually don't want any oversight. It's probably for them like, we're gonna say hands off so we don't get sued if something gets developed. But the whole idea is that they can at least allow people to contribute in a really intentional way and not just think about it from ideas and then ask Salesforce to develop it later. This allows that pace to, um, actually solution a little, to be streamlined a little bit with people willing to give back. So you can see that snapshot of changes, that's what I was talking about. It, it, it deployed everything that I had, which was nothing, and then did a snapshot of the org. So uh, right now we have an org, and one of the things, nice things it does is it sets up your user, it makes you uh, have access to everything in the org. Um, of course, access is always a big deal, so we actually um, track our accesses and summit events and permission sets that we package with the org, but yeah. um, we're going to just go look at this org that is all our org, that's our semi-locally running version of Salesforce. Summer 22 version, I guess. It just came out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to... Um, I'm going to go to contacts and edit this object so we can watch a click exchange happen. So I'm going to make a new field. I'm going to make it a checkbox. We'll call it This is the API name it auto generates, but you could make it different. And I'm going to just uh, default everything here. Normally, it would be a little more nuanced about who we'd want to give access to this checkbox to. It's adding it to all these layouts. So these are the kind you can have different layouts in Salesforce, so different people can see different sets of data. And this is adding to all of those layouts. So it's just um, adding to everything. Now, one of the interesting things, as you say that, that like everything it just walked through is like a different. I'm probably not get the right terms right, but it's like a different level of code on different pages within the actual repository. So like to actually like manually add a field, like to just do that within the um, IDE becomes like a tedious task of like, okay, we gotta do it here on the object, plus we also gotta add to the page layout, plus we have to go through each of the profiles to make sure, whereas like the Salesforce way of just adding it there, it walked you through those steps and the code is getting generated on the back end of that which I'm guessing you're going to pull down here. Yeah, so I'm going to run shortly. a task to, to list the changes that happened in the org. So it's going out to my scratch org and saying what kind of changes happened here. And you can right. see that our field is there, attended minibar. The admin profile was given access to that. Um, we generally in, in uh, code don't like to, to uh, track profiles because profiles are finely huned by some system admin. And if you overwrote one, they might be pretty angry at you. So. Uh, don't do that. Um, you can see that all those layouts were added. Uh, we can also exclude things from our list by doing exclude. And we'll do profile because that's the important one. And so I always do this before I retrieve the, just so I get a nice list. Um, so you can see that it's skipped one and it's not tracking the profile anymore and it's, it's, it's uh, showing me all the layouts and the new field. And so now I'm going to exclude. So 
is not my normal keyboard. <laughs> You're doing great. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so it's, it went out to the org. It actually grabbed, in this case, this is metadata. It's not code. It's, well, it is code, but it's XML data saying that this is the kind of field we want, and Salesforce takes that metadata and makes it happen. So if we look in our folder, we have some new things in here that are indicated by green. You can see that we got all the new layouts from that, and we got the new contact field. Um, so next time we spun this org up, we could spin it up. All that stuff would already be in place. So that field would be in place. We've tracked a click event in a code. And so um, now I'm going to quickly jump over to Summit Events and um, spin that up. And Ryan's going to talk a little bit about our journey. Um, but first, yeah. uh, let's just take a quick look at the, you can see we have a lot more code here. We've got classes. Classes also have metadata about them. So Salesforce tracks the version that class is meant to run in, in there and things like that. Um, we have content assets. We've got a bunch of uh, objects that are summit event objects. Here, those are objects that are the same as tables in other world databases. Um, and you can see our YAML file on the right here. A lot more is happening in here. This is all to like set up summit events so that you can start working on it. Um, we, this is where, here's a cool thing, this is Snow Fakery, which is part of Cumulus CI, which allows you to make fake data using a recipe, a YAML recipe. So my, uh, if you look here, uh, Snow Fakery, this is making a bunch of fake accounts, high schools and colleges, because that's what I deal with a lot. Um, This is part of Snow Fakery in that I can say, grab me a fake last name and then append high school at the end of it, or a fake city name. And you'll be surprised how real this data looks because okay. most things are named after so towns. Jefferson High School. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Okay. And yep. so, and there's some built in things like city, state, country. It, you know, it, I'm setting the industry to education. So all these accounts are getting built. In, case, in this case, there's 400 accounts being built by this. And so now you have something to work with. And in this case of some events, we have this lookup thing where you can look up accounts. And so this is put in place so we can test that out for development. But we'll go back to the terminal here. And so as you're letting that run or getting that in, um, the whole like journey and getting to here, the whole idea didn't start with thinking, let's create this community built idea. Um, it started actually at the institution we were working for in that transition to Salesforce, trying to replace everything that that inherited from like two previous developers um, to try and get it into a really meaningful um, solution for the specific the admissions recruitment team who had a very detailed and like intricate process. And if anybody went to the minimum viable product, um, conversation like the minimum there was no minimum viable product it was we need exactly what we had before and we need it in this amount of time and that was the move. <laughs> <laughs> it was just the massive 30 things so it didn't really follow the MVP process that he talked about earlier but um, but the whole process went in like we got it to a state to where they could start actually using it um, and I think most of us were really excited, but there was actually a, a long, lot of element of like that and another Salesforce admin sitting next to the team to say, like, well, what's not working? What is working? <laughs> and like building things on the fly, which was kind of cool to see. Um, but then we were actually working with Salesforce, trying to get our whole institution in a better position to really progress forward. And she saw that and started to say like, hey, like other people could use this. Would you be open to sharing your idea? And really started to put us onto this open source um, thought process and getting it into the to the greater community within the higher education community specifically, um, and I think Thad also ha has always had a mentality of willingness to share his his development. So there was a lot of alignment in terms of. Yeah, I would say definitely like, I inherited a bunch of code from somebody else when I got hired. A bunch of Java code that I yep. didn't write. It was in various frameworks and disarray, and it was like. I saw this as a grand experiment of like, if I open source this, it's good for St. Thomas because there's a community around it documenting it. There's part of the open source commons is that three different agencies kind of own the project. So right. if one drops off, another one might pick it up. And so it carries on. If I leave St. Thomas, it could still live on. 
and there would be a whole community around to help the next developer and also uh, the community at St. Thomas that's using it with the documentation that happens. Right. So, so really thinking about that long-term play, about making sure that it actually has some sustainability to it. Um, so we had obviously branded it when we built it all St. Thomas specific. Um, no other school is going to want to download a, some other school's product with their name all over it. Um, so we ended up, well, we, Thad ended up doing a lot of refactoring to actually make it a little bit more, um, I'll call it more standard or baseline in terms of the application. Um, but because it's Salesforce, anybody can iterate on it, not, even, not just from it being open source and you being pulled down from GitHub, but actually from installing the package, you can still iterate on it because it's all just basic and native Salesforce. And you can do all that with clicks or code. Right, it's kind of however you want to work. Well, with by it. iterate, you mean they yes, can add sorry. fields to yes. it. They could change the layouts, things like that. They can't change the code. They right? essentially fork it. That would be one way they could do it, or I guess the, what I'm also referring to is they could download it from the App Exchange, install it, have the managed package version, but then start to expand upon it because within Salesforce, you can start to create data relationships and fields on anything that you have installed. So it starts to make it. You could yeah. fork it though and run yeah. it and make your own version of it and run it in Salesforce. I mean, you could deploy the code that way or you can build your own package and things right. like that. And those changes never come back. They, unless you share them. Right. <laughs> and it's built, and we have a, you know, it, when you use a managed package, you get a namespace, but I've built all the code so that you could use your own namespace. Um, so it's all kind of namespace agnostic or I'm always looking yeah. for whether the namespace exists or not. So. It, it definitely is. Uh, we'd prefer it if you joined the community and like <laughs> contributed back to it. And that's why I kind yeah. of even bothered. I've been to Minibar a lot of years. I didn't bother to even remember how many. And I've never thought I'd be up here speaking. I've always enjoyed being the listener. But the reason I came is because I was, there's developers in the room and the, you know, Salesforce developers are kind of a premium. Um, but it, I think if you know that it's Java syntax and uh, it's a, a little bit easier uh, even than Java, because you're not dealing with a lot of the other things that maybe one of you would have this impetus to come join the project and have a little fun with an open source project. Open source is no fun if you're all by yourself. That's yeah, exactly. We've had other developers come on board, but yes. it, it, it's mostly been me, but there, yeah. there have been some key features that have been added by other developers. Are moving beyond uh, just Apex as well? Uh, Apex is... Well, there's a new thing called functions, which allows you to, it's kind of like a serverless architecture where yeah. you can do anything you want into it. It's still kind of brand new and a little bit beta. Um, and they're adding languages to it more and more, but that is true. Um, Apex is here to stay though. Um, right. yeah. uh, um, Benioff started in Oracle. I'm sure he just went and said, hey, can I license Java and then make my own version? And I'm sure that's what went down behind the scenes. Yeah. And that's what we got Apex from. I know we're coming up on time, yeah. so if you want to flip back, I would say that the only other thing I'll mention is like to actually get this into a formal open source commons, which is Salesforce supported, we had to go through their security review, which took about eight months, nine months, to actually like meet their standards. Um, you can see that this spun up in four minutes and 15 seconds. So when I open this up, it will have Summit Events installed, it'll have sample data installed, it'll have a site set up for Summit Events to live in. Um, so when I'm working on this project, I'm ready to go and start you know, coding against this scratch org. So if we go up here, Summit Events is, it? Yeah. Summit Events is there. Um, you, here's our kind of data architecture. This, is, this isn't about that, but we've done other things about that. Yes. You can see that we have three sample events with various test states. Um, I can go into look at one of them. You know, there's a bunch of data in there that, uh, that informs the event. Um, the one great thing about Summit events or UST events was as I was so happy the one time an event happened and I had nothing to do with it. Like it came out <laughs> on the website and ooh, I didn't even have to help someone through that. And, yes. and that continued ha happening, you know, and it still does today. I don't have to really talk too much to help people through it, but. There's, I would say there's very much of a mentality that we've very much started to focus on of like the user and end user, knowing that a lot of nonprofits, one can't afford really strong quality developers that someone might want for, for something like Salesforce. So how can we make a tool that they can manage themselves? Um, so a lot of the, the conversations that we typically have are end user focused um, to have a, a meaningful event registration type tool 
So you, the summit events, you can build lots of formats, but this is kind of a basic, simple one. Yeah. And you also, it's, it's templatable, so you can add your own school or whatever business template you want to it. Um, so this is just like a vanilla template too. You know, your questions on this one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this is all, again, this is all user determined. Yeah. I think that's the... Not a very exciting one because no. it's a sample event. This part of this is like I see this and my past mentality is like why do I have to ask IT to do this for me? Like why can't I just do it? Um, and that wasn't with Salesforce, that was with other as just like an end user and a lot of it just had to do with making sure things were gonna operate appropriately um, in security whereas a lot of times like this would be a typical user access accessible type application where they can do, they can have it all set up from a Salesforce admin and the developer had already done the pre-work. So it kind of keeps passing it down a little bit and really makes it end user focused. So the only things that need to come up are when there actually is a major issue that we need to be able to review, not a, why isn't this field have this value? That's the admin's job. Yeah. Um, that's not the developer's job. So you can see this event I just signed up for has a record, an event record attached to it now. We have uh, uh, some things built in that will auto uh, connect you to a lead or a contact, which I didn't set up in this particular instance, but in that case, if FAD already exists as a contact in Salesforce, this event would link itself to that contact, and then when you'd go to that contact record, you could see that I attended these events, because it hangs off as a lookup field. And so, that's kind of our story. I don't, yeah. it's probably, this is a different event than we've done before. We're normally showing you how to use Summit events, but I wanted to kind of show you the kind of the open source tools that were uh, built in the background for us to make these sort of things happen. And if you have any interest, uh, feel free to contact us. The slides are available somewhere. You had a QR uh, code I had a there. QR code at the end, yeah. Where's the slides? Did I close them? <laughs> Maybe. I, th I think overall I'd summarize like, the reason why this application is, has had success is because it was built with the clicks co not code mentality because of the development that's happened underneath it. Um, I think that to me is like the, the giving back component, allowing that it's free. We keep hearing of schools in particular using this who, who don't have the budget um, that uh, like a Harvard or MIT might have, and that's an extreme. I'm gonna have to call that out. Um, <laughs> but uh, they might, they're not gonna have the, uh, the budget at that level, so how can they have still meet the needs of what their institution needs to be successful um, without necessarily breaking the bank or having to make investments that they're not confident in long term. So. And the open, so or, uh, open source commons and salesforce.org made us a logo. That was nice. With their Lionheart yes. character. Yes. So, yeah, feel free to follow us on, uh, there's Trailblazer communities which are groups inside Salesforce yeah. you can follow us at and um, we have a YouTube channel and we are, our domain is summitevt.org slash code. We'll get you to the repository. And then, of course, summitevt slash minibar2022 will get you the slide presentation. So, cool. Thanks for staying late. Yeah.